thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, my name is Lindsay Bounds, and I most of you, I think, already know me, it looks like, uh, but I'm the mom and doula behind Adora Birth and Wellness. Uh, if you don't already know, a doula is like a pregnancy and birth coach. I'm not a midwife or a nurse. I don't catch babies. Um, a lot of my job centers around exactly what we're here to do tonight, which is to um, provide you with evidence-based information about your pregnancy, birth, and postpartum period, and help you make educated decisions uh, around your pregnancy. And tonight, I am joined by Christine and Amber from Vita Health and Wellness in Calgary. Uh, Christine provides um, physiotherapy and breastfeeding consultation at Vita, and she's going to help us walk through the physical side of C-section birth. And Amber is an occupational therapist and is going to talk us through the mental health aspect of C-sections, including stress, anxiety, and trauma. So welcome to Amber and Christine. Thank you, Lindsay. Looking forward to this. All right. So just a primer before we get started. Um, we are giving birth in unprecedented times right now. Uh, rules and policies are changing in different jurisdictions and from day to day. So that can be hard to keep up with. Um, some of the suggestions that the three of us may make tonight might seem very difficult considering that everything is closed. Uh, Amazon deliveries are taking longer than we'd like. In-person treatments are always available. Leaving your home can just be a really scary thought, even if it's for something that's medically necessary, like birth uh, or postpartum recovery appointments. So make sure that you talk to your doctor if you need referrals or support and look for telehealth uh, options where available. All three of us who are on here tonight have virtual support options available for our clients. So to get started, um, let's talk about C-sections. C-sections represent approximately 30% of birth, um, depending on where you're at. Some of those are elective. We just feel like that's what we want. And some of them are medically recommended. Why are some reasons that we might want a C-section? Uh, I think the main one that people are aware of is for breach or transverse babies, babies who are in a poor position and uh, that's going to be difficult for mom to birth and would result in, in a negative medical situation for both you and baby. Uh, another situation is if mom is experiencing some kind of medical distress like high blood pressure uh, or placenta previa, which is a condition that would um, increase bleeding during birth and in postpartum to a dangerous level. Um, there are also, and I, Amber will uh, certainly talk about this a little bit later, but some mental health reasons why we might choose a C-section uh, that just makes sense for us from a, a planning and a personal safety perspective. So I think where we should really start is what does a C-section look like? How does it all work? And Christine is going to be the best person to answer that for us. Okay, so um, some interesting things about C-sections. So there are actually a couple different types of um, incisions that can be done. So um, depending on um, if it was planned or um, even if it was an emergency C-section, like most of the time it's a, like a general um, horizontal scar that goes just above your pubic bone. So if you find that bone Kind of right above your urethra um, or where you pee out of, um, it'll, it, it's just a couple centimeters above that. So it seems really, really low, but that's actually how low the uterus is. Um, and then there is another type uh, where it's just a little bit above that. So generally that first one um, is below like the bikini line or below the underwear line. So generally won't be seen. Um, there's another type that's a little bit higher up and so it might just depend on the surgeon that is doing it. Um, and then one that is done generally more in like if they need to get the baby out quickly or if there's some other health reasons, then they might do a vertical incision, which would, um, uh, but that's rarely done. Um, so, but and even if it is a horizontal incision, um, there is still some vertical incisions through some of the layers because we have like skin, we have fascia, um, there's fat layers, there's um, the muscle layer, but they don't actually uh, like cut through the muscle bellies. They go along the fascial line. Um, so it's called the linea alba. And um, so that's quite cool. They, so it's to try and keep that integrity of the muscles. Um, so there, there's a couple of vertical incisions. So even though you have that horizontal line from the outside, 
if you have pain like up to the umbilical cord or your belly button, um, that can be why, because some of those incisions actually do go that high. Um, and then they go horizontal again when they get to the uterus and then bring out baby. Yeah. Okay, and just a clarification for everybody too, in the birth world, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, an emergency C-section is something that your doctor might mention and you think, well, that doesn't apply to me. But uh, in the birth world, an emergency C-section is anything that wasn't premeditated. So if you go into the hospital and labor for eight hours or 28 hours and baby is just not coming out, but it's not an emergency, there's no imminent danger, they're still going to call that an emergency C-section. Um, whereas compared to a scheduled C-section where you have a plan, a date on the calendar where you show up. Uh, so emergency doesn't mean, you know, dire straits, um, something is gravely wrong. It just means unplanned. Yeah. Yeah. There's another right. term. And... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, there's another term that they use. If it is that like the dire need of getting it out, they usually call it a crash C-section. And then that happens really fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything that we can do, Christine, to, um, you know, things like placenta, placenta previa and high blood pressure, we're not always in control of, but um, in terms of fetal positioning, is there anything that we can do to promote good fetal positioning and hopefully avoid a C-section? So I'll be honest here and say that I'm not an expert in this area, <laughs> um, but there are um, I've heard of a number of things that can be done um, through some of my other work because I was a yoga teacher first. Um, a few of my colleagues are also doulas. So I've heard lots about like spinning babies. And I know that there is a doula here in Calgary that offers um, like parent education classes on that. Um, but I can talk a little bit more about like positioning for moms. So if you think about, you know, where is your rib cage in relation to your hips? Are you usually slouching or can you move around more? So I think doing some of those like prenatal classes um, can be a really good idea where you can learn more about that kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, uh, do you have any tips about that, Lindsay? Like I am curious, it's something I want to learn about more, but I yeah, can't say. I would definitely yeah. recommend spinning babies and just good uh, postural alignment in general. So whether that's uh, doing daily exercises at home, uh, staying active during your pregnancy, doing some prenatal yoga, just doing things that promote the body's ability to expand and make space for a baby. Yeah. And also, don't, don't stress too much about it. There is only so much that you can do to affect it. Um, and babies don't always make up their mind until the final hour. Uh, there have been plenty of people who have a breach or a transverse baby who are scheduled for a C-section. And when they go in for that appointment, they always do an ultrasound right before they get started uh, to see if anything has changed. And sometimes it has because babies make all kinds of moves and twirls um, in utero on their way to coming out. So they may have just decided it's not their time to move yet. Yep. That's true. Um... Right. And I don't know if this specifically applies to anybody that I see in here, but we're going to talk a little bit about VBAC. So if you are not aware, um, VBAC, VBAC stands for vaginal birth after cesarean. And uh, sometimes that's a really challenging place to be when you're being invited to make a decision about um, wanting to have a repeat C-section or wanting a trial of labor uh, after having a cesarean. It can be a, a bit of a mental struggle. So I'm going to throw this over to Amber and say, you know, if you're somebody who has previously had a C-section, uh, or maybe this is even your first baby and uh, you're going to have a C-section, but you're already thinking ahead to the future and not sure how you would want to play that. Um, how could you go about sorting through that previous situation and making a decision about wanting to try labor? Yeah, and I think a big piece can be really exploring those feelings and where they're coming from. And there isn't necessarily a right decision and you know there's a decision that's going to be right for you but no matter what you pick you're still going to have your journey that's going to come from that but if you're going into that VBAC then um, or you're wanting to attempt that and you're not quite sure looking at what was your previous 
previous C-section experience. If you had had an emergency C-section, then going into a, a planned C-section is potentially going to be a very different experience. So is it partly related to that first experience? Was it traumatic? Did you labor, have a scary birth experience, and then go into a C-section? Um, or is this something that you're you're wanting to have this experience and you, you really wanted to have a, a, a vaginal birth and you haven't had that opportunity. So are you, are you really wanting to, to be able to have the chance to go through that experience? Um, for some people, it might be more of a fear of the medical risks, or it may be more um, related to the fear of the recovery afterwards. So I think looking back at what that first experience was, what some of those challenges are, are those, is it, is it coming from a place of fear? And is that something that you can maybe work through beforehand? Or is it something that, you know, how, how important is that vaginal birth experience to you? And I, and I think spending time with those feelings rather than just jumping that to that decision and, and just really pondering, it may be spending time um, just, just sitting with those feelings and talking to your support team, talking to your partner, to your friends, to your family, if you're working with a doula or a midwife or whoever, um, your family doctor, or whoever is, is your delivery team, really discussing some of those fears with them. And on a more personal level, it might also be exploring those feelings through journaling or art or even just sitting and breathing and having your hand in your belly and talking out loud through some of those some of those things that you're feeling a little bit torn with so that you're not necessarily ruminating and just like sitting over that fear fear and playing it over and over again but really exploring where it's coming from and seeing thinking about those decisions those potential decisions you could make and seeing how that feels in your body when you think about the c-section do you do you feel that fear in your body um or do you feel a sense of calm? And same thing when you think about going into a vaginal delivery, what, what is kind of your gut feeling that comes with that? Um, so yeah, whichever way you go is, is great. As a, you know, it can be a great decision. Um, but yeah, it can, it can be a, a tricky one just to, to explore where that's coming from. Okay. And uh, just on the flip side of VBAC for Christine, mm -hmm. uh, if your doctor says no to a VBAC, I mean, I know I've had plenty of clients who really want that and their doctor is not supportive um, for one reason or another. From a physical perspective, why might that be? Um, so one thing to consider is that um, it's about like three or four, three to four women out of five um, can have successful VBACs. Um, but so if you're one of those one in five women who it might not be um, generally advised for, there's some things to consider. And I think this is where we could also talk a little bit about just like general C-section risks. So we talked about the fetal positioning, but then there's also like fetal size. So if you tend to have large babies and it could be their head, it could be their tummy, it could just be their overall weight, um, then that's a factor. Also like mom's height and weight, as well as her age is a factor. Um, how many babies she wants to have. Um, so that's actually when, so if a, if a mom wants to have quite like more babies and maybe her first C-section was, or first birth was a C-section, then um, it might actually be advisable to try for a VBAC because then she could have more without having to have as many um, scars on her actual uterus. So there's lots of things to consider and that's why having those conversations with your birth team is really important. Um, and, and so like I mentioned that scar so that that is a concern with doctors. So, you know, it could also be like time between your pregnancies. If you got pregnant earlier than you necessarily had planned for, then that might be another factor. Um, and um, I had another thing on there. Um, another consideration is um, looking at like, you know, why did you have the first C-section? Um, and um, what are what are your reasons for wanting a vaginal birth? Because um, some of the risks with a vaginal birth would be like perineal tearing, um, which is where there's tears um, that can even go into the anus. And so what we would want to try is to avoid those like third and fourth degree tears um, or more severe tears, which is when like a C-section might be more advisable um, compared to um, yeah, trying to have vaginal birth again. So it's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to consider. And I think asking your doctor, like, why did you make that decision? Then you can actually start to see like, what was that process? And then maybe you can feel more comfortable with the, with the choice. All right. 
And uh, we're going to flip back to Amber here. So if you are someone who is is currently being recommended for a C-section or that's something that's kind of on the table um, based on your situation and you are just really not into it, I've seen this with clients as well, um, what are some steps to moving forward with that plan when you you don't really feel like you agree with it? And I, I think this comes back to what Christine was just saying, that really talking to your, your health, your provider team, health provider team to find out what was the reason. Is it really, is it, are you someone who it is very medically recommended? There are severe or high risks for you that you really should be proceeding with that C-section or is it recommended, but it's not, you know, it, it's, you could do either, but the C-section is kind of the preferred reason. And so really exploring that with, with your health providers. Is it, medical, is it medically necessary for, for you at that stage or is it one of the options, but you know, maybe their preference? Um, because maybe there is still the option to proceed with a vaginal, with a VBAC and, and, and to see if that is an option and then kind of go from there. And, and you know, maybe in that case, it is really useful to explore an option like working with a doula to have that support during that, uh, that attempt at a, at a vaginal delivery. Um, and if you do get the feedback that yes, for you, this is medically necessary, these are the risks, and it's really not a good idea to go down this risk, then having that information can help you come to that experience as an active participant instead of sort of a passive person who's had your control taken away. So if you're, if you're approaching it from control rather than helplessness, you're kind of reframing it so you can still have an empowering birth experience, even if it's a C-section, because you're a part of that experience and a part of that decision. Um, and it, it really comes back to exploring those fears a little bit more that what are your reasons that you're really, you know, holding back from wanting to do that C-section. I, I think for some people it can come from a place of um, external pressure that there can be this um, sense of, you know, to have a real birth, you need to have a vaginal delivery. And is that coming from yourself or is that sort of this external idea that's been put upon you? And if you're coming from it from a place of, of shame or of guilt or, you know, feeling feeling like to be to be a real mom or to be a real woman or whatever kind of um, place that, that can take you, just realizing that and, and just recognizing the impact that that's having on you and being able to step back and work through that to come to a place where that's not impacting your decision. Um, and I, th I think some people who really want that vaginal delivery, there can be a sense of grief at not being able to go through the birth experience that you want. And whether you're going into a scheduled C-section or if that's an, un an emergency C-section, then there is a sense of loss and a sense of grief of that experience of, you know, maybe you'll get to go through that experience in the future and maybe you won't, but it can bring up a lot of deep, deep feelings when we talk about grief, when we talk about shame, when we talk about our identity as a woman or as a mother. Um, so that's a huge piece as well. And then I think for other people, it's more the fear of the surgery and the actual medical intervention. Um, if we're coming at it from a fear of more that after piece of the extra challenges of getting around to appointments, which you know, right now may be a little bit less of an issue, <laughs> um, but being able to carry baby in the car seat and do the diaper changes and get baby in and out of a crib or a, um, a bassinet, all those types of things. Um, and if you're someone who's had medical trauma in the past or difficulty with surgeries and that adds a whole nother layer so it can go if you can identify and really figure out where is that fear coming from then it goes from this overwhelming feeling of anxiety and and fear to a more concrete problem that you can start to tackle some of those bits and pieces um, and and even just knowing this is that this is a very normal experience that women go through when when you're moving into this decision so use your team use your partner friends family doula midwife doctor whoever it might be and if you're if you have access to a mental health wellness team explore that with them and if you do feel the need to reach out to a mental health professional OT psychologist mental wellness team um, to really explore some of those things so that you can get to a place where you're you're entering your birth from that place of empowerment there there are definitely are things to do to help you get there if if that's not a place you feel you are right now right and I think uh, from from the doula perspective um, something to remind you all of is that no matter how a C-section happens, whether it's in a moment or whether it's, um, you know, premeditated and in some way elective, um, it is always a, pro a medical procedure that you are providing consent to. So even in the cases mm -hmm. where it's 
highly, highly medically recommended um, and your doctor can give you 101 reasons why, you still have to say yes to accepting that procedure. And so um, I've just thrown in the comments for you a little acronym that most doulas use, uh, and you may have learned it somewhere else as well, called BRAIN. So if you want to go to any of your appointments, this applies to a conversation about a C-section, a conversation about having an induction, a conversation about um, having a procedure to rotate your breech baby or anything really that's happening, um, amniocentesis testing during your pregnancy, anything that is a choice, um, you want to ask your doctor to help you develop, uh, evaluate the benefits, the risks, the alternatives. Is there something else that we can do to find that information? Um, use your intuition. How are you feeling? As Amber said, you know, sit with that and see how it, try it on, see how it works for you. Uh, and then also ask, okay, what happens if we do this now? What happens if we do this later? Do we have a chance to do it later? Can I do it in a week, a month, three months? Or what happens if we do this never? Um, that's going to give you informed consent. That's going to allow you to make the best decision possible. So that's an acronym to keep. Um, like I said, I popped it in the comments for you and we'll make sure it's in uh, some of your takeaway information from this session as well. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, I think we'll stick with Amber and just talk about, uh, you mentioned that there's kind of a, two different mental aspects to a C-section. Some of them, we have time to sort of grieve the loss of laboring, if that's something that was important to us. But some of them, we really don't. Um, and in the moment, you know, when you're offered that this is something we need to do now or right now for the safety of you and the safety of your baby, I mean, we're all going to say yes to that in the moment. Uh, and of course, you know, what we are set up to think as mothers is um, it, as long as my baby is healthy, as long as my baby is healthy. Uh, is that the most important thing? And is that the only important thing? It, it's it's definitely a huge important thing, but the uh, the well-being of the mother, both physically and mentally and, and the father, um, are also important aspects as well. And, and yes, I think that all of us are going to, when we hear your baby is at risk, we're going to jump to what can I do to keep my baby safe? And I think that's where it really comes from going in with with a your your ideal plan that you've communicated with your team and your advocate to to support you with that but also being able to go in with that flexible mind because I, I think one of the challenges is if, if you have your mind set that this is the way it must happen and you know this this is the only right way then when things divert from that plan then it can be more difficult. We can get back to more of those feelings of, of failure of, or feelings of shame. And even we're more likely to perceive a birth as traumatic when we have that control taken away and when something is being done to us. And, and there's a lot of risk factors that come in an emergency C-section when all those things are being done to you. So being able to approach that from the frame of mind beforehand to have kind of talked through with your partner, with your team, if you're giving birth in a hospital with your delivery nurse, if you have a doula or a midwife discussing those things in advance so that you have someone there to support you and someone who knows the medical system so that they can you know, step in and they can advocate for you if it's not needed now, um, but at the same time to be able to support you for that decision. Because when you're in the midst of labor, you're not, you're not going to be in a mental place where you can you know, logically, rationally weigh the pros and cons. You're, it's going to be an in the moment and an urgent decision. So having those people there to support you, but also going in with that frame of mind that this is a possibility and preparing yourself for that beforehand so that, you know, the, the burden of that decision is sort of shared amongst yourself and other people. Um, because maybe you maybe by by having that plan and discussing those things ahead of time, you may be able to avoid an unnecessary C-section, or you may be able to avoid a delays when one is necessary, or it may be more about being able to accept your birth experience after the fact. So there's a lot of different pieces at each of those stages that can change with that um, with that kind of discussion of all those potential things beforehand. Um, yeah, so that that open mind can. <laughs> but also <laughs> with that advocate piece can, can be really helpful. Yeah. And I think uh, what you said there just transitions beautifully into the next um, topic, which we were going to talk about, you know, preparing your home and, and preparing yourself for a C-section and then, you know, the ability to come back and 
and be successful in healing. And um, I think knowing that a C-section is on the table, uh, yes, it's not the majority of births that occur by C-section and no, it's maybe not the way we want it to happen, but acknowledging that it is a possibility and, um, you know, mentally preparing for it and also, you know, preparing your house, preparing your, um, your floor plan, your accessories, all of that to know that in the event that does happen, um, you're going to be okay. You have the knowledge and the tools at your disposal to, to deal with that, um, is something that is really going to calm your anxiety levels going into the hospital and, you know, not knowing exactly in what state you're going to come out for sure. Uh, so something that I will again, be able to provide to you after this session is my C-section, uh, essentials checklist. So it's just a couple extra things that you might want to throw in your hospital bag. Um, things like you might want to leave the hospital wearing a dress instead of pants, um, to, you know, not irritate your incision. You might want to bring a pillow for the car ride home to just be able to brace yourself. A few planning tools that uh, you may not have thought of, some tips and tricks from some of my past C-section clients that are really excellent. Uh, and you also want to think about preparing your home. So um, Christine can talk a little bit more about this in, uh, you know, setting yourself up for healing success, but um, we want to limit, you know, lifting, bending, twisting, for a little bit of time because that's going to be uncomfortable. So think about, did you, you know, set up your Huggies box on the floor in the basement or underneath the spare bed? That's probably not ideal for you at this point in time, you know, to have to go in there and get the spare diapers. Um, who's going to ferry the laundry from upstairs to downstairs when you're not really supposed to be carrying that kind of weight? Uh, can you set up a secondary change table in your living room so that you're not going back and forth to baby's room to change diapers eight, nine, ten times a day, which is newborn reality? Uh, those are some things you want to think about, and I will make sure that you get the tip sheet that details those all for you as well. Uh, so when we talk about physical healing, we've, we've had our C-section, you know, what's done is done. Christine, what can we do to help with wound healing? Is there anything that we need to do? Okay, so there's quite a few things. Um, and I actually want to start with adding on to your list because I think it's really fantastic. Um, but some of the things to consider is like if you have a tall bed, having a step stool beside your bed so that you don't have to like jump up. <laughs> um, and then for things like if you're going to be, um, uh, sometimes what can be helpful is if you're si like laying on your side for sleeping, having an extra pillow that you can like place underneath your belly can feel good because for some women just having that pressure even of their belly going to the side can feel like too much so just knowing that there's ways you can help support it um, and then things like rolling to the side and then using your arms to push you up um, can be really helpful rather than just like sitting up and I think sometimes it can be just like a shock to the system when you don't realize like oh right that that, that doesn't feel good um, and then for uh, looking even closer at the C-section wound, um, so something you can do is called incision splinting. And this is something you can do for any kind of surgery. So you can take like a rolled up towel or like a small pillow and place it over your, um, over the incision. And, um, and I would recommend that for anything, like if you know you're gonna be coughing or sneezing um, for like going poop. <laughs> Um, I think sometimes, like, regardless of whether uh, you gave birth vaginally or with C-section, that first poop can be kind of scary for people, and they don't realize it until that moment. So just knowing that you can do things to help. Um, and then also avoiding things like, um, uh, like we call it the Valsalva, Valsalva remover, maneuver, and that's how some people actually try to poop. So they actually strain and so they might, like, hold their breath and, like, push down. Um, so we want to try and avoid that. So you can think of like blowing out candles or um, just like blowing out through a little straw as you exhale, um, just so that you know you're not holding your breath. Um, and then some other things like you can use ice. So if you're going in, if you don't know if you're going to have a vaginal birth or a C-section, then um, using those like padsicles, <laughs> people like... Um, uh, have those so you can use it for either one you can either use it um, over the vulva or you can use it over the scar so just depending what ends up happening you can use it both ways um, and just knowing to put a layers of clothing between that and the cold skin 
or the cold pack. <laughs> um, and then other things, so like the incision, you want to keep it dry, you want to prevent infection, um, so keep it clean, uh, follow all the recommendations for bathing and showering. Sometimes you're not allowed to bathe with a C-section scar until like a, about a week later, so just knowing what those recommendations are. Um, when you are going to be, if, if they don't take the bandages off for you in hospital, if you're doing them yourself at home, then maybe like doing it in a warm shower can be a good option. Um, but, and you want to inspect your scar, you know, every day throughout the day, like, you know, you don't want to be, um, you know, constantly doing it, but just checking every once in a while to see like, is it closing? Has things changed? Is there getting to be redness or, um, other signs of infection like pus or, um, like red streaks around the area, or if you get a fever, things like that, you want to get that checked, um, really quickly. Um, as things heal, um, something that's really neat to use is um, silicone gel or tape that you can put over the scar and so then that can help with healing over time but you want the scar to actually be healed at that point like um, you don't want it to be open at all um, and then like well, looking at longer term then there's things like um, being mindful of sun sensitivity so if the scar is above the bikini line um, scars are actually sensitive um, to the sun like up to a year. So um, you can get different pigmentation if you're, um, if it's being exposed to the sun. Um, and, and just being mindful of that, like this healing is a process. There's multiple layers um, and a, a scar is often still healing at about six weeks um, and then can continue to about like six months and even further. Um, so not that you can't do things in that time, it's just knowing that it's, it's not the same as before. So, um, but yeah, and then some other things like uh, you can do physiotherapy. So like we can teach you how to do scar massage. We can teach you lots of exercises of, um, you know, like actually getting into like stretching and things like that. Cause we want uh, that scar to be able to move. Um, and yeah, and then I, I know there's more questions about physical activity later on. So I'll leave that at that. Sure. And uh, just a reminder to everybody that you can pop a question into the comments box. It should be somewhere on your right-hand side, or if you don't see it, um, you can probably hover down to the bottom to open that option. Uh, one question that we did have is, um, are my stitches going to be dissolvable, and, or do I have to request those? And um, generally, yeah, the standard is that they will be dissolvable, and they will be stitches, not staples. Um, different situations, you know, different, different bodies, different surgeries might necessitate something a little bit unique, but generally in Calgary, you are going to get dissolving stitches and you're not going to have to go back to, to get those bits removed at, you know, two or three weeks postpartum. Okay. So I think we're uh, good on, on the incision part, the, you know, the tummy part. Now, Christine, uh, I mentioned, also does breastfeeding consultation. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, having a C-section is going to affect breastfeeding, both, you know, from a physical perspective, how am I not going to hurt myself while I'm feeding, um, and also from uh, a readiness perspective. Yeah, so one of the things to consider with C-sections, um, and a lot of women don't get told this, is that... Um, Compared to a vaginal birth with C-section, it often, um, your milk supply will come in later. So it's usually an average of about four days versus like a couple of days with a vaginal birth. So um, you may have colostrum in that time, but the milk might just take longer to come in. Um, so some of the things you want to consider is like asking for the skin to skin contact like at, um, during a C-section. So if you're under general, general anesthetic, that might not be possible, but um, if you are awake for it, it is an option and you can sometimes um, at least have like a first latch at that point while, while things are being closed up. Um, and another thing to think about if you are offering or um, if, you're, if you're wanting to breastfeed but your milk is taking a longer time to come in um, and you're needing to use formula. Now, of course, talk with your team about all of that, but a type of bottle that I would recommend is a slow flow bottle. So if you're doing both breastfeeding and formula feeding, um, either like a Dr. Brown's preemie nipple or a Playte Playtex Ventura are the ones we usually recommend. So then the babies still have to work for it and it's not just so fast. And it also means they can swallow it easier and things like that. So 
Um, those are just some little tips for that. But then to also think about like breastfeeding setup, I actually have some pillows here. And so you can take just like regular pillows and have them set up so that they're like at an angle. I use two different colors for a purpose like that. So then the pressure isn't right on your scar. Um, so that's an option. Also, I mean, like the, um, the actual breastfeeding pillows are fine to use too. So if you have something that's softer, usually something like, um, like a firm breastfeeding pillow may irritate it more likely. So like oh, the ones we often recommend and they're actually made here in Calgary is the baby buddy. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, but then you can also think about other positions for feeding. So if that like cross cradle position, I'm going to put my baby here. If that cross cradle position just is too close, then it might not be comfortable. So you could do things like football. And this is you know, very sad. <laughs> um, and um, there's my other one there. Oh, and you can also feed in side lying. Um, and a trick with side lying is that, um, so you might want to start with the breast that's closest to the bed. And again, you can use like a pillow or something underneath your belly if you need to. Um, and then um, once you've fed on the one breast, you can actually like do like a quarter turn and then feed on the top breast. So you don't necessarily have to roll and move baby over, which might um, just aggravate things. Um, yeah, so just some different options. So um, uh, another option is laid back breastfeeding and that's gonna just depend on your baby and the different situations. So, um, but if you're having difficulties, get help early. Um, sometimes it's just really little tweaks and, um, and then you can continue breastfeeding without it having to be painful. Yeah, that's a great tip. And this is where I'm going to throw in a pitch for you, Christine and uh, Mercedes, who I know is here too from Vita Health and Wellness. Um, Christine and Mercedes are doing virtual um, breastfeeding and lactation consultations at this time. So if you feel like it's um, too scary or just not advisable to leave your house, um, to see, you know, a lactation doctor, or maybe it's just something that you need a little bit of help with. Uh, they're doing telehealth appointments and you can schedule those on their website because it is definitely better to get help early. Yeah. Especially if it's like related to positioning and pain and things like that. And cause then we can screen if we're like, no, actually this is something for the, for the docs to see, and then we can refer you. For sure. All right. So, you know, we've, got home we're working on breastfeeding we're working on taking care of our wound and and doing some personal healing but uh sometimes the way it goes down with c-section is everything just happens really fast or in a way that we didn't expect now we're at home with a newborn and you know it, now we're at home with a newborn in a pandemic um grandma can't come over uh we just can't get as much help in the house or out of the house as we expected and you know, motherhood is just not going the way that we thought. So Amber, when that happens, what do we need to do about it? Yeah. And I think, I think you covered earlier some of the physical things that you can do that some of those things that are physically really difficult around the house when you don't have someone else to rely on, that those types of things can make a huge difference on how can you, how can you functionally make these things work in your house with less help than you might've ideally had. But I think from, from that mental health perspective, one of the most important things is acknowledging that you are doing the best that you can in a really challenging situation. Um, the first three months after birth are considered the, the fourth trimester for a reason, and that our bodies are going through a lot of transition and healing, and our hormones and our emotions, and we're adjusting to a huge new life, whether it's your first child or whether you're adding another child into the mix, there's a huge change. So rely on others for what you can knowing that right now that's a little bit different and being easier on yourself that there are things that you physically won't be able to do and there are things that you mentally won't be able to do and and working through acceptance of, of some of those things um, can be really really helpful and I think people tend to have high expectations of themselves and we may you know go into the birth experience with certain expectations for how things are going to turn out so um, when it comes to breastfeeding work you may envision this perfect breastfeeding scenario where you, you know, your 
milk comes in and baby latches easily and everything's easy and everything goes great. But we know in the real world, that's often not the case. Um, so it, it's finding what works for you. Um, like Christine said, whether it's positioning, whether it's um, flipping between, between breastfeeding, and if you do use bottle feeding, whether it's through pumping or whether through formula or whatever it is, but same thing with going into the birth experience with that flexible mindset. If you can also go into the um, the postpartum period with that flexible mindset that you're figuring things out. This is this is new. Um, just like sleeping arrangements, there there's recommendations of how to keep that safe, whether you're room sharing or if you're co-sleeping or if your baby's in another, like whatever whatever you're choosing to do in that scenario, it's finding what works for you that's within kind of what the, what the safe guidelines are. And I think with expectations for ourselves, we may see on TV, you may see in the movies that, you know, people give birth and then the next week they're out walking the stroller with their hair done and their makeup on and looking fantastic. And we know that real life is, is a lot different from that. And so coming back and stepping back from what that expectation is for yourself to, to come to that more realistic place. And right now, if you're, if you're limited in that support that you physically can't have someone come over and hold your baby while you go and take a rest. Um, maybe you can still have some of that social support. So scheduling, you know, those phone calls or those video chats or relying on your partner when you can and finding those, those little ways to kind of make those things work. Um, I think one of the big things too is during the first two weeks postpartum, um, it's really, really common to have what's called the baby blues. And the baby blues are different from an actual like postpartum depression or anxiety in that 50 to 80% of people get the, post, the, the baby blues. And that's when we tend to be you know, weepy or anxious or emotional, where we're not sleeping, we're physically healing, um, adding the complexities of a C-section to all of that. And and it's, it is, you know, it, it's gonna, life's gonna feel a little bit all over the place. <laughs> but if beyond those couple of weeks, you're noticing that things are, are really not getting easier, or they're getting harder. Um, if you're noticing that you're really having distressing memories, or really caught up in, in you know, that C-section experience, especially if it was an emergency C-section, that you had that loss of sense of control. Um, if you're struggling with having you know, been in that birth experience and people talking over you or those medical interventions that you really didn't want. And if you're replaying those or having nightmares or really finding it hard to find enjoyment, having a lot of fears that are, that are un difficult to control, not feeling enjoyment in things that in, in your baby or things that you normally would or not feeling that connection with your baby, and that might be a sign that maybe it is good to seek out that help. And right now, even with, with the way things are going on right now, and you, if, you don't, if you don't have the ability to have that same support in person, um, there is that option of telehealth, of still talking to your family doctor, calling us at Vita, calling your maternal wellness team, um, reaching out to your birth team, but to get that support so that if you are struggling with postpartum trauma or postpartum depression or anxiety, that you're able to get that help through that. Um, we do know that, you know, birth, a difficult birth is, it's kind of like a, a rippling effect, or a rippling effect that it's kind of like dropping, dropping a stone, <laughs> the birth, difficult birth of the unplanned C-section might be that pebble falling into the water and all those ripples on, on breastfeeding, your relationship with baby, baby's health, your physical health, your mental health, your sleep, you know, everything can be impacted. And we do know that that emergency C-section is kind of a rip, um, a a risk factor for that. So starting that healing process earlier, instead of having that, expecting that whole year to be tough. And if you go into it with this mind frame that I should feel terrible because <laughs> that's what happens when really, you know, th there are tough times, but that full first year, that full first few months shouldn't be so hard that you're not able to get any enjoyment out of it. And if you're there, and if you can start that healing early and get into that place of actually, you know, gaining from this experience and moving forward and creating those relationships that you want and getting back to, you know, what you want life to be, starting that early rather than waiting can, can be um, a really good long-term outcomes for you and for baby, as well as giving you that joy during that um, so important period. Yeah, and to just talk a little bit about um, near-term C-sections, so those of you who might be having um, a C-section or giving birth in the next um, few weeks to months, uh, something that I mentioned in my birthing during a pandemic session is that uh, 
our Alberta's top doctor, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, has mentioned that it would be okay um, in a lot of cases to have a cohort family. And that just means basically a, another family that your family is being sort of monogamous with. You're both only seeing each other. And I think for newborn families, that's a really great option um, to, to look at and, and not have to say, well, I can't have any help. Well, maybe you can have the help of your sister or your sister-in-law or your cousin who lives nearby who could be bringing you groceries and also hold baby while you have a shower and do some of those little small jobs or even socially distant jobs within your house. Maybe they can make you a meal and not go within six feet of baby. There are ways to work around that um, that are going to be, again, approved or uh, safe according to our medical advisors. Um, as well as support you through this journey. There are some creative ways around that for sure. Uh, okay, and Christine, um, so if we had a C-section birth and maybe we didn't push, um, we can expect our pelvic floor to be feeling really great, right? We shouldn't expect to see any symptoms on that front? Well, that is a common misconception. <laughs> um, it is, so there is some research to say that uh, C-section may be um, protective in those first few months um, for the pelvic floor, but at about six months, it ends up being about the same regardless of what kind of birth you had. Um, so um, pregnancy itself is a risk factor for pelvic floor symptoms. Um, so that might be leaking um, or pain or the various things could be going on. Um, and, um, but we also want to think about, like, think back to our discussion about the anatomy of the surgery, is that uh, we're still getting very close to those pelvic floor muscles, um, and our core is very important for pelvic health. So anytime that we're having any form of abdominal surgery, we should be considering the pelvic floor, um, and especially if there's been pregnancy. <laughs> um, but to also think like, uh, you know, um, like I said earlier, a C-section may be the right choice to avoid some of those more severe tears. So um, it's, uh, uh, especially if we're, if we're choosing between like an instrumental birth and a C-section, you know, I think that's a, a discussion to have ahead of time uh, that could be really important. Um, but yeah, it's, there's, uh, you can still certainly come see a pelvic floor physio, even if you didn't give a vaginal birth. <laughs> Okay, and these two topics are going to go together. So um, when we talk about returning to physical activity, um, again, some of you maybe already have given birth or uh, are going to give birth quite soon and are going to be looking at enjoying the summer with, you know, your walking or jogging stroller and uh, maybe not being so housebound as we have been recently. So when is a good time to return to physical activity? How are we going to do that? And what kind of activities um, are going to support positive healing, knowing that uh, we've had major surgery. Yeah. And so um, one thing I like to say is that like physiotherapy is a lot more than about a lot more than exercise. And so I like that you frame this question as physical activity because um, like, you know, we're often given that six weeks clearance of that's when you can start getting back to exercise, but what do you do in those first six weeks? So I have a lot of moms, usually I see them on the breastfeeding side of things and they're like, I'm just not really sure what to do right now. Like, I feel like I can do stuff, but what do I do? So um, following a C-section, actually, while you're still in the hospital, you can start to think about things like gentle range of motion. So that would be like, you know, moving your shoulders around, moving your legs a bit, um, doing like uh, ankle pump action is really good for getting that blood flow. Um, and circulation in your legs. Um, uh, you know, you can sit at the edge of the bed and straighten and bend your knees a little bit. So these things sound really simple when you're still walking around normally, but then at that time it can be, these things themselves can feel like a workout. So uh, just being mindful of that. Um, and then if you go for a walk early on, make sure you have somebody with you if possible. Um, so like while you're still in the hospital, I'm thinking of and, you know, have them either have a wheelchair with you or a walker or something. Not that you might, you might not need it at all, but just knowing that um, you've just had a major surgery and so things could be very different um, and you just start small. Um, so then for those first six weeks, 
you can think about um, uh, so especially like that first week um, you want to keep things like really gentle you know maybe you start walking a little bit um, uh, they usually say like limit stair use for the first week so I liked Lindsay's recommendations earlier of like have your, have your things out and plan you know how much you're going up and down the stairs um, some say you can start to begin like light housework around one to two weeks following the surgery um, so you know maybe like sweeping and things like that but maybe referring from like vacuuming you know it's it, there's not like hard lines about this often the recommendations are to refrain from lifting anything greater than 10 pounds um, but like a baby in a car seat is usually over 10 pounds. So some doctors will be like baby in car seat is okay. Others will say it's not okay, but that you can only hold baby. So just be mindful of that. Um, and one thing to think about too, is that sometimes like these recommendations are that they're recommendations and they're ideal, but in some situations, especially during a pandemic, you know, you might have more jobs you know to do and you might not be able to follow those recommendations exactly or maybe you have kids at home who weigh more than 10 pounds right so um and sometimes women can feel a lot of guilt around not following those recommendations um but so just do what you can and have those conversations and it's okay if you can't follow them exactly but talk to somebody if you need help as far as like how to plan those things um so some other things to consider. So for those first six weeks as we're getting a little bit further along is you can start to think like 20 to 30 minutes, four times per week. Um, of course you can do more than that, um, but like build it up, go slow, simple, gentle. Um, you know, it might just be walking around your house or maybe walking around the block and that's great. Um, but it can be a struggle, I think sometimes for people who are more active in general. Um, and so just recognizing that some of those like regular activities, like, you know, doing the dishes might feel like a workout for you. Um, and then, yeah, continuing on as you start to um, heal more and more, like find ways to get exercise into your day, you know, like think about each time you have to pick something up off the floor, like, how is that an exercise, right? So, um, and if you're starting to get more pain, um, with exercise, like I would definitely recommend getting assessed. Um, you know, it, it might be helpful to get assessed regardless and then you can start to build that plan. Um, and um, yeah, you can, it, there's lots of ways to, to progress. Um, and then another thing I wanted to just touch on was, because uh, it's a physical activity is intercourse. Because um, a lot of times, so traditionally it's kind of, um, around six weeks is when it starts to be said to be okay. Um, but to consider, you know, wait until you're physically and mentally ready. I've definitely had women who like are four months postpartum and are like, I still haven't had sex because I'm scared. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's good to talk to somebody about it. And so like somebody like Amber would be really good um, as well as like talking with us on the physical side of things. Um, and when you do choose to, to start having sex again, Remember using lots of lubricant. Sometimes silicone is best in postpartum, um, but use what works best for you. Um, and because if you're breastfeeding, like vaginal dryness is very common. Um, so just knowing it might it may feel different from um, from what it was like before. Um, yeah, and I'm going to use this as one more opportunity to uh, plug how much I love. Um, Beta being a multidisciplinary clinic, uh, there are not a lot of places that you will come across that offer um, something that touches on the, the physical aspect of pregnancy, birth, and, and parenthood uh, that can also couple it with the mental health aspects. Uh, because so many of these issues that we face as new moms are multidisciplinary. And if we only um, address the physical symptoms or we only address the mental symptoms, the problem might improve a little bit, but it's not necessarily going to resolve. And so um, if you experience any of these challenges related to a C-section or, or birth or um, just being a new mom, Vita is a great contact to have um, and, and to keep in your phone because they can help you through all of those different phases to make sure that you get to a resolution. So I did have, I'm going to throw it back to our guests just to ask you if you have any more questions. Nicola sent a couple of questions over. Um, I don't see her in the chat. So Nicola, maybe you're waiting on the replay, but 
Uh, Nicola was hoping to learn, will I have to wear a mask the whole time while I stay in the hospital? Obviously, that is a, a COVID specific question. Uh, and what I will say is that for Alberta right now, yes, AHS is going to uh, be masking all um, moms or birthing people as well as their support people when they come in now, especially um, in light of our nurses at Foothills Medical Center in Calgary uh, being exposed and testing positive, they will be asking you to wear a mask at this time. Um, tomorrow, next week, next month, that may change. These these policies are changing on a daily basis. But if you were to go in, you know, tonight or tomorrow, yes, you will be asked to wear a mask the whole time. Um, the other thing that Nicola wanted to know is, will dad be able to be there for a C-section or would he have to leave right away? Um, again, as of today, yes. Uh, if he is healthy, I will add that caveat. Um, yes, if he is healthy, he will be able to stay for the birth and be with you in postpartum as well. Um, but at any given time, that could change. So keep an eye on the AHS website for those new guidelines. Uh, I'm always updating those. There's a COVID-specific um, page birthing during a pandemic on my website where I'm keeping track of all those for you as well. Uh, and I don't see any questions popping up in the chat. So I am going to take this opportunity to thank Christine and Amber for being with us tonight to talk all about C-sections. A list of key information is going to be emailed to you after this session and the replay is going to be available as well. If you have any follow-up questions that just, you know, pop into your mind uh, tonight or tomorrow, feel free to follow up with any of us. Um, you can do that through Facebook, Instagram, uh, connecting with us directly on our websites and those will be on all of your follow-up information too. Uh, virtual breastfeeding, physiotherapy, and mental health consultations are available and now through Vita Health and Wellness in Calgary. You can contact them by phone or by email to set up something there. Uh, and from my side, um, doula services are still available. Um, we may not be able to help you physically, um, you know, in person, or we may, depending on uh, who you ask and what day. Uh, but virtual support is available as well as hands-on too. So you can find me through Adora's website as well. Thanks so much for coming and good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone.